All right, I'd like to thank you guys for, uh, for coming because I understand that there's a few alternative events tonight. <laughs> there's like something having to do with like balls. <laughs> the, um, the Democrats and Republicans are debating over in the union as well as several other events. Um, let me start by giving the thank yous to the, to the various organizations that made this possible. Uh, the Strengthening the Professoriate at Iowa State uh, University Initiative, which is to kind of spread a culture of broader impacts for ISU scientists. The Departments of Agronomy and English, the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication, the Programs of Speech Communication, Rhetoric and Professional Communication, Bioethics, the Graduate Program in Sustainable Agriculture, and also the Committee on Lecturers. And let me also say a special thanks to my colleague, Michael Thompson, who is the co-organizer and really the originator of the idea of bringing Professor Zeresky to campus. Um, he's very unhappy to have been called away on a family emergency, but I, I want to express my gratitude to him for all the hard work and imagination he's put in. So to briefly introduce Professor Zeresky, um, David Zeresky was a debater, a champion debater at the Northwestern Powerhouse Debate Program where he also worked as a debate coach. Um, those were his major honors. Uh, along the way, he also managed to get both an undergraduate and PhD degree from Northwestern in Communication Studies, where he joined the faculty, rose eventually to be dean, and, uh, and uh, before his retirement was the Owen Kuhn Professor of Argumentation. Winner of numerous awards within the discipline, he served as president of both the major rhetoric societies, the National Communication Association and the Rhetoric Society of America. Um, his scholarly contributions are very extensive and in particular are notable for their focus on two of the most controversial periods in American history, the period leading up to the Civil War and the era of the 1960s. But tonight, we've lured him into speaking on rhetoric and science. So, Professor Zareski. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Goodwin, for uh, that generous introduction. I'm delighted to be here. I've enjoyed myself all day. Uh, the opportunity to visit with Gene Goodwin, who was for several years one of my colleagues at Northwestern, and to see good friends like um, Ray Deeren and Amy Slagle and Maggie LeWare, to meet a number of other faculty and graduate students. Uh, and I'm very sorry that a family emergency called Michael Thompson away uh, this evening, not only because I was looking forward to becoming reacquainted with him after 44 years, and you can do the math and conclude that we were both pretty young when we, when we met before, uh, but also because, as I understand it, uh, he is somewhat responsible for my being asked to talk on uh, this particular topic tonight. The question I've been asked to address is science and rhetoric, two cultures or one? And lest I leave you in suspense, I'll tell you now that the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> The question itself, of course, derives from the British philosopher C.P. Snow, who famously wrote in 1959 uh, on the subject of two cultures, and he referred to the sciences and the humanities as being fundamentally different in their ways of thinking uh, that came from different views about whether we can separate the knower from the known, the humanities in general arguing no, and the sciences in general arguing yes. These differences, of course, were not thought to be neutral. One or the other of the cultures was to be preferred, and whichever one was preferred was the one that you associated with. What's prioritized depends upon what one's own interests are. Some of the differences that have been cited between them, and of course rhetoric is fundamentally part of the humanities, it's one of the original seven liberal arts, and a discipline that's based very much in our understanding of ourselves and of the human condition. But some of the differences that are popularly imagined are captured 
in the publicity piece for this lecture, which said, we tend to think of the discourse that forms public opinion, that is rhetoric, as manipulative, self-interested, partisan, repetitive, and irrational. In other words, the very opposite of idealized scientific discourse, logical, dispassionate, and fact-based. Now, I realize this was written as a foil for me to respond to. And yet, it does capture perceptions, ways of thinking about these disciplinary groups that are not uncommon in our public usage. Common stereotypes of rhetoric have it as a pejorative term. Sometimes it's taken to mean bombast. Sometimes it's taken to mean discourse without substance, often preceded by an adjective like empty or mere. Sometimes it's taken to mean ornamentation and flowery language. And sometimes it's taken to mean that most dreaded of all college courses, Rhetoric 101, which is freshman composition. It implies in all of these different usages something that's somehow manipulative that's captured in the phrase the engineering of consent, that people's agreement is somehow engineered and not reflective of their true interests. Common stereotypes of science also abound. Sometimes science is venerated. Sometimes, on the other hand, we have the image of the mad scientist, an otherworldly figure, agents of destruction, the dark terrors unleashed by science, in the words of President Kennedy's inaugural address. The convincingness of science is often alleged to result not from the merits of its case, which the scientist is wont to change, but rather from the social prestige that's afforded to science. And we sometimes think of science as being, in fact, rhetorical all the way down, the scientist being free to change his or her own mind whenever it suits the purpose. Now, if we view either of these fields in this way, it seems to me that we invite some serious problems. On the one hand, we disable science from playing the role that it could or should play in public decision making. We, the scientist, in turn, may dismiss the public as unenlightened yahoos who are unprepared to accept the clear dictates of science, or the scientist may regard the public as being unable to understand that scientific claims ultimately are based on probability, not certainty. And as a result, science doesn't carry the weight that it perhaps ought to carry in public policy controversies and decisions. Meanwhile, we disable rhetoric from serving as a tool of democratic governance. If we think that rhetoric is about manipulation and about the engineering of consent, then it's something to be avoided if not fought. And so we don't imagine another model, another way of looking at rhetoric and we don't train students in the essential skills and tools of rhetoric with the result that, guess what? They're unprepared to function effectively as citizens. So my thesis tonight is that, yes, there are some differences between science and rhetoric, but they're neither as stark nor as fundamental 
as they're often made out to be. And here I want to develop the point, develop the argument, by telling you that I think what got Michael Thompson interested in having me speak on this topic was he ran across some of my early writing in which I suggested that there was a way of looking at evaluating contest debates that was somehow analogous to the scientific method. And I still believe that 44 years later, that rhetoric can be seen as analogous to science rather than as its opposite, and science can be seen as employing a specialized mode of rhetoric. So that's what I want to try to develop tonight. And I emphasize that what I'm talking about are ways of imagining science and rhetoric, choices that we have available to us that would cause us to see them not as two separate cultures, but as complementary. So how should we understand rhetoric? Here let me put on my disciplinary hat for just a moment and say that the study of communication is about the relationships between messages and people. How we create messages, how we use messages, how messages influence us, how we influence them, and how through them we influence each other. Rhetoric, which is sometimes thought of as a subset of communication, and sometimes as a transdisciplinary subject that bridges communication, English, philosophy, dialectic, logic. Rhetoric is specifically about persuasion. It was Aristotle most famously who defined rhetoric as the faculty of discovering the available means of persuasion in the given case. Now, persuasion simply means influence on another's thoughts, beliefs, or actions. And there can be many kinds of influence. For example, forming an opinion or belief where one didn't exist before, seeing something from a new perspective, strengthening one's commitment so one feels more strongly about a subject than he or she did before, weakening one's commitment so that one begins to feel doubts about something that he or she was certain about before, conversion, actually changing people's minds, which is sometimes the only thing people think of as persuasion. But it sometimes happens that people started out believing one thing, and as a result of the influence, they come to believe something else. Moving someone from belief to action, to not only holding a set of ideas or beliefs, but to doing something on the basis of those beliefs. Now, what all these things have in common, aside from being influenced, is they're grounded in the particular case. So rhetoric is all about finding and using available and appropriate means of persuasion in a given case, which means that theory building in rhetoric takes the form of inductive generalization from specific cases rather than deductive covering laws that are derived from a priori theoretical statements. Now, rhetoric is also grounded in audience. In fact, the ultimate standard for judgment in rhetoric is the assent, the agreement of the relevant audience. Now, that agreement is sought ideally under the condition that it is freely given, that it is not coerced, that it's not the result of pressure or threat, but that it's freely given. 
Now, since that's the case, it means that the claims that one advances and the methods that one uses are always open to challenge. And what does rhetoric produce? It produces meaning and influence, and its byproducts are personal relationships. Now, the particular dimension of rhetoric that interests me tonight is argumentation. Argumentation is the process by which we justify the claims that we make upon other people's belief. We justify them under conditions of uncertainty. Now, there's a lot that's packed up in that statement when we say that argumentation is about justifying claims under conditions of uncertainty. So let me unpack that by talking about five key assumptions that are wrapped up in that statement, and then we'll begin to see how argument could be viewed as an analog to science. So first assumption, argument takes place with an audience in mind. In fact, it depends upon the audience. As I said, the audience is the ultimate judge of success or failure. Now this contrasts sharply, not with science, but with formal statements, such as 2 plus 2 equals 4, which are true not by any reference to the external world, but simply by definition from their formal properties. The statement 2 plus 2 is 4 is true regardless of whether anybody believes it to be true or not as a result of stipulated definition. But in argumentation, as in science, the claims that are being advanced are not universal, but they're subject to the acceptance of actual listeners or readers. A couple of historical examples that make this point. We often think of the Federalist Papers, and I suspect many of you have encountered the Federalist Papers, we often think of them as abstract statements of political philosophy. In fact, they're rhetorical documents. They were written for the purpose of influencing the vote of New York in its convention that was called to ratify the Constitution. And so if you read the Federalist Papers, you read them against the backdrop that here was a key audience in New York that had certain fears and certain reservations about the Constitution, and the purpose of the Federalist Papers was to address and resolve those concerns. Or to use another example that I discussed with a few of you in Professor Goodwin's seminar this afternoon, the Lincoln-Douglas debates are widely talked about as the model case of public political debate. Statesmanlike arguments addressed directly to the great issues of the day. Well, I'll tell you something. Anybody who says that has not read them. In fact, there, there was an aphorism in a book about 50 years ago that made this point very clearly, saying the Lincoln-Douglas debates are vastly more admired than read. If you do read them, you'll discover that they're full of personal attacks, charges of conspiracy and plot, lengthy arguments about what would the founding fathers have done if they were here on the scene, and arcane disputes about the specific language of certain clauses in the U.S. Constitution. And they're repetitive, and they're often not disturbed by evidence to support the claims. <laughs> now why? Why are they the way they are? Not because we should be cynical about them or because people then were cynical about them, but because both Lincoln and Douglas 
were crafting their arguments with a view to who were the swing voters in the state of Illinois. And the swing voters in the state of Illinois happened to be people mostly in the central part of the state who were both opposed to slavery and opposed to abolition. And you might ask, how could that be? And the answer was, they were people who believed in general that slavery was wrong, and as a wrong, it would need to be done away with in God's good time. But abolition was such a drastic measure, such a rapid and immediate measure that the social fabric could not tolerate it, and so they couldn't imagine immediate abolition. Well, those are two historical examples of discourses that are designed with the audience in mind. We can cite contemporary examples as well. Say what you will about the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, whichever term you prefer. The fact is that the components of Obamacare were drawn largely from the Republican health care proposal that was put forward in the early 1990s as the alternative to the Clinton proposal. Now you might ask yourself, why would the Obama administration develop its program in that way? And the answer was, again, related to the audience. It made the judgment, which turned out to be mistaken, but it made the judgment that it would be able to develop bipartisan support for health care reform if it built into the centerpiece of its proposal what were clearly ideas of Republican parentage. Or here's another example. The arguments that are going on right now about immigration reform that reflect the fact that everybody has read the results of the most recent presidential election, and yet what to do about those results is not self-evident. And so you find people on both sides of the aisle saying that any, any measure must include both border security and a path to citizenship for undocumented uh, residents currently here. Why that particular package? Because those involved analyzed the audience and said, there's a significant number of people that are willing to accept, after the election, that are willing to accept a path to citizenship if they can get significantly strengthened border security. And another group that's willing to accept border security if they can get a clear path to citizenship for illegal immigrants already here. And so from this audience analysis gets crafted a particular set of arguments. Now when I say that arguments have to take the audience into account, I don't mean to say that any argument is as good as any other argument if only you can find somebody who will accept it. There are other considerations that also have to be taken into account, and yet the audience is one of those that must be considered. So that's the first assumption. Argument takes place with an audience in mind. The second assumption, argument takes place under conditions of uncertainty. It was again Aristotle who wrote that about matters that are certain, no one deliberates. And we can see why. If there's a certain answer, or a certain way to get an answer, why take the time and the effort to go through a discussion or a set of arguments or claims and counterclaims? That's certainly not the most efficient way to reach a decision. Or as the semanticist Wendell Johnson wrote almost 100 years ago, in reference to what had been the great medieval disputation about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, which the medieval scholastics addressed by finding texts and finding uh, 
uh, earlier claims and so on, uh, Dr. Johnson said, it's simple. Bring me the pin and bring me the angels and we'll count. So about matters which are certain, nobody bothers to deliberate. Nobody bothers to make arguments. But if we say that argumentation deals with the uncertain, we are saying that things always could be otherwise. We could imagine them differently. We could understand them differently. controversy over evolution versus intelligent design illustrates to those who are not committed to one side or the other to start with that it's possible to imagine our origin and development in markedly different ways. Of course for the zealots committed to intelligent design there's no other way to imagine it. And for the vast majority of the scientific public committed to the theory of evolution, there's no other way to understand it. But controversies, controversies develop when there are differences that are genuine and that matter to the participants. Some of you will remember several years ago there was one of the Super Bowl commercials that showed a vigorous debate in which one of the participants said that a certain beer tastes great and the other responded it was less filling. Now the question of whether beer tastes great or is less filling is obviously not a real controversy for the simple reason that they're not mutually exclusive and that for most people the difference doesn't especially matter. But when the differences do matter to the participants, then we have a genuine controversy. Now, since things could be otherwise, and the right answer is not known for sure, arguments ask us to make an inferential leap a leap from the known to the unknown. And what an arguer does in asking us to make that leap is the arguer provides reasons for our doing it. And that brings me to the third assumption. We've said argument depends upon taking the audience into account. We've said argument deals with uncertainty. The third assumption is that argument involves justification for claims. The arguer offers reasons that would convince a critical listener to make that leap from the known to the unknown. Now, by the way, justification is not proof. It's not proof in the sense that we expect a geometric proof to yield a certain result because remember we're in the realm of the uncertain. So a justification doesn't tell you that something is true. It tells you you have a good reason to believe it and act upon it. You have a good reason to make this inferential leap from the known to the unknown. Now justifications have degrees of strength from the logically possible, which is a very weak standard of justification, doesn't take much to convince somebody that something's logically possible, all the way up to the highly probable and forceful. And of course the goal of argument is to present the strongest justification that one can. But justifications are always provisional, they're subject to change in the light of new information or new arguments. The fourth assumption, and this is one that I'm particularly interested in exploring, is that despite 
its seemingly adversarial character. Argumentation is fundamentally cooperative. Now, first off, why does argumentation have a seemingly adversarial character? Because it takes place between or among people who disagree about something that matters to them and who want either to convince each other or to convince a third party audience that's paying attention to the argument. So argumentation has a seemingly adversarial character. Someone at dinner described it as mortal combat, which I guess I wouldn't go that far, but it sometimes looks like a very hostile proceeding. But let's think about the role that my antagonist serves, or that your antagonist serves, or the interlocutor, whatever term you want to use. And it seems to me that the presence, the presence of an opponent serves the purpose of quality control. Serves the purpose of quality control. How? Well, first of all, I have a pretty strong incentive to come up with the strongest arguments I can for my claim if I know that there's an interlocutor over here who is prepared to dispute the reasons that I produce. I know that I will be held to account and that produces an incentive for me to come up with the best arguments I can produce. At the same time, if my arguments can withstand the critique or the refutation of an interlocutor, then you, as the third party audience, can accept my arguments with greater confidence than you otherwise would. You would be more willing to make this inferential leap that I was describing just a minute ago. So, what kind of contribution does this quality control make? It improves the rigor of the decision-making process. It reduces the likelihood of omitting critical details or making critical mistakes and it increases one's confidence in the result. Now beyond saying that the interlocutor is there for positive reasons, we can also say that underneath any disagreement is a substratum of agreement. That is, arguers have to agree in order to disagree. They have to agree, first of all, about what the matter is under discussion. They have to have a common language or system of meanings. They have to share procedural assumptions about things like what counts as evidence. Let me digress here to talk about an example. As I told several of you this afternoon in the seminar, I'm currently working on an analysis of the argument in the second presidential debate last fall between uh, President Obama and Governor Romney. And you will remember that they got into a rather substantial disagreement about when and whether Obama had said that the attack on Benghazi was a terrorist attack. And there was bitter dispute that, was, uh, that had a lid put on it when the moderator intervened into the debate and made a, made a claim of her own. But that's, that's not my point at the moment. Obama and Romney clearly agreed that an early denunciation of the act as terrorism was valuable and that delay, a delay in declaring it terrorism was harmful. And that agreement underlay their disagreement 
about whether Obama had responded early or late. If there hadn't been that agreement that the timing mattered, the argument wouldn't have made any sense. So underlying disagreement is agreement about the subject matter under discussion, a common system of meanings, what counts as evidence, and certain basic values like courtesy, modesty, respect for the audience, a willingness to listen, a willingness to be convinced, and so on. Now, there is a species of argument that doesn't work this way. And it's been referred to as deep disagreement, a situation in which you go all the way down and you can find no underlying substructure of agreement. In fact, I have argued that our current politics in this country models deep disagreement. I don't think it actually is because the polls tell you that on many issues there's a much wider degree of public agreement than is represented in our political system. But our politics, by and large, models deep disagreement. And you know as, what, as well as I do what happens when that's the case. It's impossible to proceed constructively. And so there are interesting studies that are being done about if you get into a situation of, of deep disagreement, how can you jolt the system to get out of that situation, whether by shifting the frame of reference or uh, by arguing that one's opponent's position works against itself or whatever. But for constructive interchange to take place, there has to be this underlying stratum of agreement. So, okay, we've got four assumptions so far, and the final one is that argumentation entails risks. That when we engage in argument, we take on risks. And there are two basic risks. One is the risk of being proved wrong. I use proof loosely because, remember, I said we're not talking about proof. But the risk of being shown to be wrong and thus losing the argument and the other element of risk is the loss of face that results from the perception that one has performed poorly in the argument. Now, why would people take on these risks if they knew for sure what was right? They'd have no incentive to. They could simply assert what was right, and if people disagreed with them, well, so much the worse for them. That only shows that they're in the grip of error, they're recalcitrant, you don't have to worry about them. But people do regularly take on these risks and engage in argument, and they do so because we don't know for sure that we're right. We think we are but we don't know for sure, and we value another person's agreeing with us that we're right only if that agreement is freely given. So, what I've said so far is we can think of argument and we can think of rhetoric in another way other than as hostile and manipulative. We can think of it in a way that reflects these five key assumptions. And if we do that, then I think we can easily imagine argumentation as an analog to science. Not the same thing, but as an analog to science. In one of the great scholarly journals, Popular Science, the American pragmatist philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce wrote an article in the 1870s called The Fixation of Belief. 
And Peirce in that article said, there are different ways of knowing. If I were to ask, how do we know what we know, Peirce would say there are four different ways we could answer that question. One is tenacity. We just stick to the first beliefs we get. That's how we know. One is authority. We know something because somebody in a position of authority has said so. Of course, the, the classic case of this is papal infallibility. Or third, we know something because it corresponds with something we already know. And so we can deduce it from something we already know. This is the way the Declaration of Independence reasons, by example, for example, when it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And from these self-evident truths, other things follow because they're consistent with them. Or, says Peirce, the fourth method, and the one he's ultimately going to say is the best, is verification. We check them out. And that, of course, is the method of science. We accept as true only what has been tested and found to be true. And the test results and the test procedures are open to public inspection. The advantages of this method, the method of science, are it's reliable. Since there are controls, you get the results you get by design, not by accident or happenstance. It's replicable. Somebody else could perform the same test, and if they get the same result, it increases your confidence. And they're flexible. The bases of the argument can be reevaluated in the light of subsequent ideas and information. So, Peirce argues, the scientific method is to be preferred over tenacity, authority, and a priori correspondence. But what happens, what happens if we accept the method of verification? as the standard for our granting the status of knowledge to claims. What happens if we say this is the way that we come to know what we know? Well, we have to then dismiss from the realm of knowledge or rationality such things as probabilities. values, predictions about the future, recommendations for action, the uncertain and contingent. In other words, much of what comes into the realm of human affairs. If we make verification our only standard, then there's no way we can know anything about these matters. There is no legitimate space between what is necessarily true and what is purely arbitrary. Now, there was a group of thinkers in the years immediately after World War I known as the Vienna Circle of Logical Positivists who were prepared to accept that position and said, for example, that making a statement of value that something is good or just or uh, beautiful is really just a report on the state of our glands, on how we're feeling when we make that statement. But most people would have trouble. Most people would have trouble with that position. I know we have a number of English graduate students here tonight, and so I will invoke uh, the name of the late Wayne Booth, a theorist of uh, the rhetoric of fiction, among other topics. And Booth, in a book written in the 1970s, talked about what are the consequences of taking the position that we have to dismiss all this from the realm of knowledge. And he said, we get into one or the other of two modern dogmas, he called them. One of which was 
scientism, which he defined this way. He said, since rationality is not possible except in formal reasoning, and science is not, and, and verification is the only method available otherwise to decide what's true, then there are no reasons for changing one's mind that are better than any other reasons. It's a pure relativist position that results from having no standard other than verification to be able to apply to values and predictions and so on. Hence, one is indifferent to the choice. Now, this is carrying tolerance for diversity to its logical conclusion that any argument's as good as any other argument if there's no way to verify it. Or the other dogma, he says, we could fall into, he calls irrationalism. And by that he means, since there's no way that one reason can be superior to another, and yet we have to make decisions, decisions should be made by some what he calls higher reason, the keys to which are the intensity of one's passion. Now, you can imagine where making decisions based on the intensity of one's passion could lead. And so Booth concludes, we have to reject this notion. We have to reject this notion that there's no way to know anything about values, predictions, uh, priorities, probabilities, recommendations for action, and so on. But if we reject that view, then what do we do? And the answer, seems to me, is to imagine an alternative view that says verification is not the only sound way of deciding what we know. We need to look for analogs to the functions that are served by verification. Well, we need to find analogs that we could also say are reliable and replicable and flexible and so on. And it seems to me that we could conclude that argumentation is a possible analog. Why? Because of its stress of mutu on mutual agreement to the procedures that are going to be followed and to the underlying substrate of agreement that reflective judgment is the goal that's sought. There's a self-regulating quality to the instrument, just like a scientist is going to do his or her best work knowing that others can come along and replicate. The arguer will do his or her best work knowing that there's an interlocutor there who's available to criticize or to challenge. So we could say that argument can function as a way of knowing with respect to some of these categories that are not amenable to knowledge through verification. Now, suppose we approach argumentation in this way. Well, we've extended the bounds of what counts as rational or reasonable. We've led to a different view of rhetoric it's not fundamentally adversarial or hostile. It's not fundamentally manipulative or based on the engineering of consent. And it makes clearer the relationship between rhetoric and science. Both are methods of knowing by testing claims. In one case, by the procedures of verification under controlled conditions. In the other case, by the procedures of argumentation. They're both empirical rather than formal in that they're dependent upon the facts of the world and the nature of the case and the external environment. Well now then, if that's so, how should we view science? I'm going to spend less time on this because I'm not a scientist and I don't consider myself expert in this area. But I think there's some things we can say. The philosopher Stephen Toulmin wrote a book in the 1970s 
called Human Understanding, in which he talked about academic disciplines. And his metaphor was to say there are compact disciplines, there are diffuse disciplines, there are would-be disciplines, there is the undisciplined, and then there is the undisciplinable. <laughs> and uh, in, in that latter category, he would put, for example, many of the arts. Now, what makes a discipline compact is its agreements on basic paradigms, basic models, basic ways of thinking, basic methods, basic exemplars of good research. And his example, his example of the compact discipline is atomic physics. He would put rhetoric somewhere out between the would-be and the undisciplined, I suspect. Uh, and then, as I said, he would go all the way to the undisciplinable. I was talking this morning with Professor Crosby, who used a different metaphor, and he said, the sciences are urban disciplines. They build upon themselves, like skyscrapers. The humanities and rhetoric are rural disciplines, which means they spread way out. I've sometimes said they're you know, a mile wide and, and an inch deep. The implication of saying that science is a compact discipline is that it's able easier to accumulate findings and build upon findings. So one of the things that emerges here is that the distinction that one begins to see between C.P. Snow's two cultures is not so much a difference in culture as it is a difference in compactness, to use Toulmin's term. This means that we could think of science as a specialized discourse community. That is, a field in which arguments are addressed by and large to other specialists and where there are conventionalized and commonly accepted modes of presentation. For instance, you read research reports in scientific fields and there are some fairly standard divisions of the research report. You know, the nature of the problem, the hypotheses, the method, the findings, the discussion of implications. There are certain conventions of diction, like the use of the passive voice, which most composition teachers will tell you ought to be avoided. And yet the passive voice is deliberately cultivated in scientific writing. Why? In order to separate the knower from the known, in order to emphasize that what the report is doing is reporting on naturally occurring phenomena, not ways of seeing. And so uh, you will tend to write, uh, such and such was observed <clears throat> rather than I saw such and such. The use of control groups imply, is, used, is, is done to imply causality. Now causality is one of those things that can't be proved. It can only be inferred. And so if you have two groups that are essentially alike in all respects but one, and they come out different in the end, you infer that the cause of the difference in the end is the one respect in which they're different. But we don't know that. There's no way to know that. And yet the mechanism of the control group supports that inference. And the report is written in such a way as to uh, suggest that all possible extraneous factors have been controlled for, when of course one never knows if one has identified all possible extraneous factors. And statistical tests are commonly used in order to operationalize probability. Now if you think about it for just a minute, these examples that I've just mentioned are examples of 
scientific discourse. The arguments and the claims that scientists make to one another in seeking to advance the cause of science. They are a form of rhetoric. Not in the sense that they're manipulative or that they're trying to engineer consent. Remember, we've, we've put that to the side. But in the sense that they are claims made with a particular audience in mind, employing conventions that are known to that audience, and using them in order to try to elicit agreement as a result of freely chosen assent. Another characteristic the processes of discovery and of justification are kept separate in the scientific report. That is, the scientist may come up with his or her idea or hypothesis by analogy, by narrative, by intuition, by some aha moment. But the issue in the scientific discourse is not how did I get this idea, but why should you accept it? And that's why, that's why there's this common rhetoric of justification. A couple months ago, my wife and I were in London, and we traveled one day to Cambridge uh, to meet with a former student of mine who was at the University of Cambridge, and who took us around and took us uh, to lunch in a genuine English pub, and we had the experience of sitting at the very same table where Watson and Crick in 1953 announced their discovery of DNA. Now, I leave this to your imagination, but they were sitting around with a group of colleagues, undoubtedly having a few pitchers of ale, and regaling their friends with the story of this new find in their laboratory. Do you think it sounded the same as the report they would write up for publication to justify their claim that they had found DNA? I doubt it. I doubt it. Which tells us that the occlusion the hiding of the discovery process and the focus on the justification process is a convention of scientific discourse that ends up serving the purposes of science. Now, one of the implications of all this is to make clear to us what just about any scientist would probably acknowledge, and that is the findings of science are presumptively correct, but they are not self-evident or certain. We don't know for sure. Science, just like rhetoric, works in the realm of uncertainty and probability. Now that implies something. It implies that the statement that all the science about X concludes Y does not conclusively establish that Y is true. And in making such a statement as that, one is then unprepared or unable to deal with an audience member who says, I'm not so sure about why. Instead of saying, all the science concludes X, the way for science to have more weight in public controversy is to revert to the reasons, the reasons that X is being advanced as the most compelling explanation. Which brings us back to the fact that arguments are addressed to audiences and must be persuasive to the audience to whom they are being addressed. 
which brings us back to rhetoric. And in fact, there is a whole subfield of rhetoric of science that, as I said before, I'm not expert in, but it makes the point. It makes the point that scientific discourse, albeit specialized and conventionalized, is a form of discourse. Now, what happens if we view science in this way? Well, we emphasize that scientific explanation is a human activity. We rebut the notion of science as otherworldly, detached, purely objective, dispassionate, or completely rational. And one of the things that that does for those of us in the humanities is it makes, us less, it, makes it less defensible for us to be scientifically illiterate. Because if science is not this whole otherworldly separate culture, then humanists have the same kind of responsibility to understand science that scientists have to understand the humanities. Four years before he was elected President of the United States, John F. Kennedy delivered the commencement address at Harvard University. And in his conclusion, he told the story of an English woman who had written to the provost of the college to which her son was about to attend. And she wrote, don't teach my boy poetry. Don't teach my boy poetry. He is going to stand for parliament. And of course, the implication being that politicians, members of parliament, didn't need poetry because they were in a separate culture. And Senator Kennedy concluded perhaps she was right, but I think that if more poets understood politics and more politicians understood poetry, the world would be a better place in which to live. Well, we have to substitute some terms here, and in place of poetry and politics, we could say science and rhetoric. And I think that if more scientists understood rhetoric and more rhetoricians understood science, the world would be a better place to live because these realms of human activity, while not identical by any means, are complementary in ways that we don't begin to appreciate when we regard them as two completely separate cultures. Thank you. What makes you think that? I, I had Ray Deeren in mind. <laughs> um, I mean, if you make rhetoric dependent on audience acceptance, how do you avoid the sense that if there's going to be manipulation um, and foolery of various kinds? Don't you have to say that we want to direct it at the best audience, the people that are morally good and that will take the rhetoric seriously and think about it? So we have to build some, uh, an idealized audience to make, to make your argument work. Well, partly. I'm, I'm glad I mentioned Ray because I'm going to invoke the name of somebody he studied very thoroughly, uh, Chaim Perlman, the Belgian uh, philosopher and, and uh, theorist of, of jurisprudence and also of rhetoric. That we do have to have a sense of an idealized audience to which we're appealing at the same time we are in fact directing an appeal to a particular audience. So the danger of thinking only of the particular audience is that there's the temptation to cut corners in ways that you happen to know will appeal to the predispositions of that particular audience. And uh, what holds that tendency in check is the fact that you're imagining this particular audience also as an instantiation of an idealized audience. That, that, and, and that's a notion that you have in your head. Okay? Now, in practice, can we say there's never any manipulation? Of course not. Of course not. I mean, there's often 
uh, manipulative moves, cutting of corners, lack of concern for the free ascent of the audience, etc. And that's where the critic or the interlocutor comes in to point those things out and to try to, uh, to hold the original uh, rhetor to a higher standard. Yes, sir? As a follow up to that, and it seems to me there are some contexts where the effectiveness of the deceptive move depends on the presence of an interlocutor. I mean, for example, if I've got a case, and it, it seems to me many political situations are like this, um, one side may require an elaborate you know, set of uh, an elaborate provision of evidence, and the other side may refute it with a with a, a sound clip that appeals to people's prejudices or, or predilections of other sources. Mm -hmm. That's very effective, right? But the effect, the, the ability of that to be effective, depends on presenting the person who's giving the complex case as a wandering fool who's you know talking on mm -hmm. and on and on when I can just make this case quickly. Mm -hmm. So there are. There are deceptive moves that, well, I want to say they depend on the existence of the, the interlocutor. And that undermines, I think, the claim that rhetoric of this sort is, is necessarily cooperative. It seems to me effective rhetoric is often uncooperative in just that sense. Well, uh, let me take the last part first. And, okay. you know, say you're, you're obviously right, at least on the, in the surface sense. Um, I, would, I think that even in cases like that, uh, if you plumb more deeply, uh, you can get to some level of cooperation. There, that there will be, you know, maybe it's some source of evidence that's held in common or some belief about the ability of the audience to evaluate the evidence that's held in common uh, that would enable the first rhetor to argue that the second is dangerously oversimplifying or uh, insulting the intelligence of the audience or, or this, that, or the other. So, I mean, I could imagine a situation like that playing out in a way uh, that, that it's still cooperative. Uh, but there is in the, in the long history of rhetoric something of a tension uh, that you speak to, I think, very well. Um, and that is that uh, at the same time the ideal conceptions that I've been talking about have been held. It's also been held to be the case that rhetoric is populist by nature, anti-elitist by nature, uh, it's grounded in the predispositions of audiences, and that includes the prejudices of audiences and uh, the predilections of audiences, uh, and that we all, uh, to one degree or another, get a certain satisfaction out of debunking the expert, uh, and so on. So that uh, you know, there, there, there are some appeals that are based upon elaborate displays of evidence, and there are some appeals that are based upon uh, disparaging elaborate displays of evidence. But I think the, the, the underlying assumption of the rhetorical situation is that nothing is predetermined or fixed about those outcomes. And that's, that's sort of the way I started off the reply to you, where I, I can imagine situations where those, where those could be taken as givens and still worked with in an ultimately cooperative way. Yes, sir? What it sounds to me that this discourse thus far lacks, so you pointed to this, is the concept of history. So Gene talks about an ideal audience in preference to the actual audience. Uh, but it seems to me self-evident, if I may, that very few discourses, and I think this is increasingly the case, have a single punctual audience. Mm -hmm. Mitt Romney learned that. Obama learned that lately with his nice little clip about the good looks of the Attorney General of the State mm -hmm. of California. Mm -hmm. In a world where everyone's packing a recording device, <laughs> there are multiple audiences in very short spans of time, not to mention historical yeah. audiences. So it's probably true that in a given rally situation, you can rally the troops by waving a particular flag. But if there's three or four people with recorders and they get on CNN, yeah, yeah you, you, make a, you make a very important point. Uh, and this, this is a phenomenon that has happened so recently and so fast that it's really not been theorized very much at all yet. Uh, but I would, I would venture a guess that it may have the unexpected consequence of pushing one's conception of a particular audience closer 
to one's conception of the idealized audience for the very reason that you will be less and less able to separate out the peculiarities and the predispositions of, of this group or the ideological bias of this group or the demographics of this group in a world where everything can be overheard. Yes? Mm -hmm. But a lot of the arguments that get made in public don't seem to be very conscious of each other. They don't seem to be dialoguing of each other where they're, they're uh, 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 agreeing on, on some things in that way. Or maybe people are making arguments trying to find somebody to, to engage with. Well, I, uh, I mean, I have not studied this dispute as closely as I would like to. Uh, but it seems to me that there is widespread agreement to the claim that guns should be kept out of the hands of wackos. Now, there's a fundamental disagreement about whether the way to do that is to regulate the supply and availability of guns or whether the way to do that is to uh, make it less likely that uh, people I've just described as wackos will be able to, to obtain them. Okay, so I mean on that there's, there's disagreement significant disagreement. But I think on the, on the underlying premise, my reading of this debate is that there's actually a fairly wide range of agreement. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you think that the uh, inability of the scientists to be, uh, to, um, to be a rhetorician, a rhetorician um, will affect this, this, this ability to make moral decisions somehow? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a real good question. Um, I think so. I mean, I can't be just overwhelmingly confident of it, but I think so. Uh, because, I mean, what the, what the scientist as rhetorician does is to step outside a box that regards science as self-contained. And, you know, I, I, I mean, frankly, I don't, I don't think a lot of really good scientists regard it that way, but it forces it forces a scientist in a position to think about relationships between you know, his or her claims and, 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 uh, and audiences. I thought you were going to ask me a different question, actually. I thought you were going to ask me, does, do I think that that improves the ability of the scientist to function as a scientist? And I would say definitely there, uh, and I give a little plug to the research project that uh, Gene Goodwin is heading up that, that talks about the fundamental importance of communication for scientists and some of the difficulties that scientists encounter uh, working beyond their, their, their lab when they, when they enter into public discussion. And by its nature, uh, this kind of focus would sensitize scientists more to, to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and explaining it means that you have deep understanding, so right. you also thought deeply about it, which also can affect the moral implications of your research. Right. Just time for one more question, if anybody wants. Yes. Do you think if people really knew how science was done, that that would uh, take away from substantive argument on the positive side. In other words, when we write papers in this discipline, uh, we often uh, will cherry pick some of the better moments of our scientific endeavor. Uh, in a given speech, we might tell some of the really good aspects, but we won't tell every aspect where a piece of equipment blew up and you know, did something like that. Mm -hmm. so, so I heard you say a little bit about the discovery process, and, and I, mean, I don't think you used the word suppression, but I, I mean, mm -hmm. it, there's, there's just some things that, that might get in the way of an argument. So do we, are we consciously doing that just by the nature of being scientists, or is there a kind of a larger kind of scheme involved here with rhetoric? And is, you know, I don't know if I'm asking yeah. any kind of question. Well, you know, your question fits into the genre of 
do you really want to know how sausage gets made? Okay, and you know, in, in all the variations in which that question comes up, the answer usually is no. You know, you'd rather not know that so you can appreciate the, the, the final product. But I think the examples that you describe are not cases of scientists acting as scientists. They're cases of scientists acting as rhetors. Now, they're selecting what they think will be the most persuasive with the audience that they're trying to reach. And it seems to me these are natural uh, tendencies that any rhetor would make. And there are good reasons why we have a process that permits criticism and replication and uh, openness of, of findings and methods and, and so on. And, uh, I, think, I think if people really understood that in all of its richness, I don't think it would diminish the authority of the claim that the scientist advances. <laughs> Thank you.